um, we're made up of art historians, um, designers, researchers, all with an interest in engaging the public in art, science and technology. Um, if you want to find out more about us or work with us, we do panel discussions like this, commission artwork and things. Um, our website is axnscollective.org, so that's art times neuroscience. Um, and tweet us as well at AXNS Collective, um, at AXNS Collective, of course. Um, so before I hand over to our panel and our chair, Dr. Sarah Dillon, um, I just wanted to read my favourite Terry Pratchett quote from the late great, um, which is, real stupidity beats artificial intelligence every time. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, um, over you to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, am I okay? Everyone can hear all right? The mic seems to be working nicely. Um, before I introduce the panel, I've been asked by the Web We Want Festival to trail what's coming after us, which is, I believe has sort of been recently slotted into the programme. Um, so after us is Toronto-based famous new media artist Jeremy Bailey, who's performed recently in New York, Amsterdam and our own Tate Liverpool. And he will be giving apparently an augmented reality lecture on how to avoid avoiding patent. Now, if you don't know what that means, uh, nor do I, stay afterwards and listen to his lecture, and uh, I'm sure you'll find out. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to uh, introduce the panel and the panellists for five minutes or so, um, and then each panellist will talk um, for their own five minutes, and then we will have discussion and plenty of time, I hope, for you guys to join in towards the end. Um, I'm uh, Sarah Dillon, I lecture in literature and film, I have a particular passion for science fiction, which is one of the reasons I'm here, um, but I also do quite a lot of work on the relationship between literature and, and film and science, and I'm very interested in the ways that um, directions of influence can flow backwards and forwards between the two, um, so I guess that's why I was asked to chair. Um, today. Um, I think there's also another reason, which is when I told my dad that I was chairing this panel, he reminded me of uh, way back when I was four years old and we got our first BBC cassette-driven computer, I don't know if you remember these, and you put your tape cassette in and it took about 20 minutes to load up uh, the most basic game you could imagine. Um, and we went back after 20 minutes, we all sat around the table and the computer brought up the first question, it was a quiz game, and uh, I turned to my dad. And, and my dad was like, yes, you're right, which he was kind of surprised about because I was four. Um, but he was more surprised. He said, why are you whispering? And I said, so the computer won't hear me. Um, so even then, at age four, I knew where we were heading. Um, <laughs> to fast forward to a, a more contemporary moment, so lots of you may be aware of the discussions about AI that have been going on in the press um, and in uh, the media since pretty much since Stephen Hawkins made his announcement to the BBC uh, last December that I quote, the development of full artificial, I can't do his voice, I should do his computer voice, shouldn't I, which he's chosen to keep even though he could make it more naturalistic. Um, the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. And of course, when Stephen Hawkins makes pronouncements like that, everybody starts listening. Um, shortly afterwards, the Future of Life Institute in the States held a conference, um, and they issued an open letter calling for the need for what they called um, key priorities that would guarantee robust artificial intelligence. And whilst that sounded rather formal, when I read through the open letter, it was put much more simply towards the end, which was, our AI systems must do what we want them to do, which is basically what they were um, saying, that research started to need putting in place controls that would mean that what we'd created um, stayed within our control. And I think that gets to the heart of the current debates about AI, which is, is it beneficial? or is it a catastrophic threat to the future of humanity? And I think the answer is, of course, that it's, it's both. Um, and I hope we can kind of unpack that paradox um, over the next hour. What's also very interesting when one takes a historical perspective on AI is that actually the, the kind of research into it is fairly recent. So if you're looking for a history of AI, you, you're kind of going back to literature and film and science fiction, which has imagined it um, from very early days, from actually as far back as Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which you might think of as the original AI text. And it's from Frankenstein that we get the idea of the Frankenstein complex, the idea that that which we create is going to um, grow up and rise up against us. And this has been a common theme in, um, and we may talk about this in, in AI fiction and film, um, throughout the centuries, 1920, Carol Chapek's play, Are You Are, which some of you may be 
familiar with, if you're not, go and have a read of it, it's fantastic. I've not seen it performed, I don't think it's you know, regularly on the circuit, but it would be lovely to see it performed. And it stands for Russell's Universal Robot, Robots, and in it, precisely this idea of the robots are created, and then they rise up and kill their masters. Um, but what's very interesting about the end of Chapek's play is that they then start to figure out how to reproduce. And this is the kind of, the, the second big fear about AI is that once we create an artificial intelligence, it will then reproduce itself to pr produce a super intelligence, and there we'll have the singularity and humans will be no more. Um, there are, of course, many other um, science fiction works related to AI, and I'm sure we will talk about some of them today. We won't be able to get through all of them. But I think it's important to note that we've got both a cultural resurgence of interest in it, the scientific community recognising that they need to start putting parameters in place, and we've got this upsurge of recent films about AI as well. In 2015 alone, we've had um, The Avengers, Age of Ultron, uh, Chappie, I don't know if any of you have managed to see it, from the fantastic directors of District 9 and Elsium, um, and uh, Ex Machina. So it seems that we're at a very crucial historical moment for imagining the future of AI in both science and in fiction, and there couldn't be a better time then, I don't think, for this panel. Um, who I am now very pleased to introduce. So, uh, on my right, if you follow the publicity for Ex Machina, you will know that during his research, Alex, Gar Alex Garland came across a book that he says was by a guy called Murray Shanahan. Um, oh, so I'm actually starting at that end, sorry. Um, the book was Embodiment and the Inner Life, and its author is here today um, on the end there. Professor Shanahan is Professor of Cognitive Robotics at Imperial College London, and as we've just been talking about, very busy at the moment doing the festival and public engagement circuits, talking about AI to the public. Um, because of Garland reading the book, he actually became ex machina scientific consultant on the film. So if the science is wrong, it's all his fault. <laughs> um, ex machina imagines what we will probably unpack, um, strong embodied AI. That, that's AI that has general human intelligence and which interacts corporally with the world. We're actually a very long way scientifically from achieving this. But another of our panels, panelists here, Carol Sullins, has had the very strange experience of imagining a technology for a film that then actually was invented by scientists between the film's production and release. I'm sure he will uh, talk to us more about that uncanny experience. And his um, first feature film, Listening, is premiering at Sci-Fi London, the wonderful science fiction film festival running at the moment. It is, however, sold out, so if you don't have <laughs> tickets for this evening, um, you can't go, but I believe an international distribution deal is, as we speak, being negotiated, so keep an eye out for a more general release of Listening. And, and finally, uh, here we go on my right, in contrast to strong AI, which is um, possibly still in the far future, we're already living in a world uh, populated by specialist AI, Apple, Siri, um, the AI that's just been designed to um, self-drive cars, being uh, just two examples. These kinds of AI are very common and often disembodied. And in this sense, I think they share a very interesting relationship with data which we so often perceive and imagine as disembodied, think about the cloud, this kind of, that it's stored somewhere up here. And big data in particular is the specialist topic of our third panelist, Richard Adams, an artist, musician, and writer who currently works at the Royal Shakespeare Company and serves as a senior fellow at the University of Lincoln. Um, Richard has recently described big data as the contemporary realization of psychohistory. Anyone know where psychohistory is from? I know. Yes. The Farm Foundation, yes, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, good. Yes, describe, so he's described big data as a contemporary realisation of psychohistory, the fictional science in Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, which can make general predictions about the future behaviour of very large groups of people. So I'm delighted to welcome um, all our panellists today um, to address the questions raised by AI in fact and in fiction. And I will hand over first to Richard. Hello, I um, also write these things down in stories which are available on Kindle and um, and uh, I, we were asked to just create a, a very short sort of three minute um, positioning statement. I'd like to just walk you through a few pictures and talk over the top of them. Um, firstly is that most of the fiction that I come across, and I've come across as a science fiction fan for, well, since I was three or four I guess, um, has been romantic for me. It's a, it's a very romantic view of AI. 
AI. Um, a lot of it is about building robots that look like us. And this is the dominant view if you talk to people, that you know, they imagine a robot. And this goes right back to Chapek and, and even beyond to Frankenstein. The piece of writing I'm working on at the moment is called, subtitled, The Modern Frankenstein. Which, if anyone's read Frankenstein, will know that that was the modern Prometheus. And that piece of fiction is about what happens when we create artificial intelligence and by default new life, and we then turn it off. What right have we got to turn it off? Um, but we tend to romanticise. Uh, we make them good. <laughs> and they are often good. We're on data. We make them evil or conflicted. Conflicted is an interesting one, because I was watching 2001 again recently, and conflicted is the word that sprang to mind for how, rather than evil. And it struck me as a very political film, actually, in retrospect. Um, the real intelligence is later on in the film, as, as you know, I'm talking about. But we've even made, you know, artificial intelligence robots into the god, the devil. And that is a wonderful application of the robot devil from Futurama. Um, but, you know, in the end, my take on AI ultimately is that it will feel very alien to a large extent, unless we stop it doing that. Um, the real artificial intelligence in 2001 for me is that monolith. I know it is a tool, I'm described as a tool in the book, but it is a gateway to a completely alien intelligence, of which we can make no sense. We can't make sense of it in the film either. Poor old Hal is just a pawn in a political game. And this is where I like, as a, as a positioning statement, I guess, my current interest lies in watching person of interest on, on TV, Netflix, wherever it's available, um, where it, it's police procedural drama based around the premise of a man who invented the Uber surveillance device uh, after 9-11, and the AI invented, so all sorts of conditions around it, it's black box completely, so it cannot divulge privacy, you know, private information, but it spits out social security numbers of people, and they have no idea what this is about. So they either have to protect the person, catch the person, help the person, whatever. And through the series, it's got better and better and progressed. And this is kind of where my thinking is on, on the writing I'm doing, is that they've introduced a second AI from a rival corporation. Both of them are actually, in a way, fighting. But the series cannot explain what the motivations of the AIs are. So they are very, very, very alien. Now, we will build, ultimately, AIs that can talk to us and behave in the way we want them, absolutely sure. But a huge amount of the stuff that I've come across recently, and the, the stuff that I've been working with with predictive healthcare and things like this, has been quite alien in its nature. It just makes predictions and it's based on, you know, whatever, data, algorithms, etc. And I'm glad to see in something like Person of Interest that that is being reflected, finally, in fiction. The AI in that series is completely alien. Um, and it is firmly and utterly rooted in those smart systems that are currently emerging. And it's a really nice idea because, you know, even a, a nice film like her was rooted in, in the idea of a person and a person. It was a rom-com in a way. <laughs> um, and we may actually create, you know, anthropomorphic robots for entertainment. But at the same time, we may also create, you know, um, disanthropomorphic ones. Um, as fiction people, as a fiction creator, I want to know how do I deal with something that's so alien I can't contextualise it in a human sense. I mean, that's a really tough challenge. So the play I'm writing at the moment is literally about AIs. I give them a human motivation, but the human motivation is just so that I can get them to talk. Their relationship with the outside world is completely fractured and broken. And then the outside world is trying to turn them off. So if we're creating life, what right have we then to turn it off? You know, we are not gods. And I'll finish. We are, after all, creating new life, but not as we know it. <laughs> um, so that's my position. Thank you. Um, can you, can you put or uh, I'll go back to 2000. You have a nice graphic behind us. Just for the photos. There we go. Look at that. Yeah,
Yeah, Brilliant. Um, and actually, that, that's wonderful given that we are moving on now to a film director and we have our, our film background behind us. Carol, do you want to make your contribution? Um, sure. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Khalil Sullins. I uh, wrote and directed a feature film sci fi thriller called Listening. Uh, as we said, yeah, it's having its international premiere tonight right next door at uh, the BFI here. Uh, it's a movie about uh, telepathy, actually, not about AI specifically, but uh, it's about grad students who uh, basically use currently available technology to invent mind reading uh, software and hardware. Um, that they think it's going to solve all their problems, but of course it does just the opposite. Uh, especially when a uh, covert government organization gets a hold of the technology and uh, has decidedly not uh, positive plans for the technology. Um, and yeah, it's a hard sci-fi film, so uh, I really did my best to uh, talk to some science advisors or doctors and friends that I knew uh, and to get all of the science in the film right, so that everything you see, similar to 2001, like a hard sci-fi just means versus fantasy sci-fi and hard sci-fi, all the technology you see either actually currently exists or is still theoretically possible. Uh, and so the way, if I briefly explain it, I guess in my film, the way uh, they invent telepathy is I sort of did some research into brain-computer interfaces and what was going on there. And I'm no scientist, by the way, so I definitely, uh, yeah, uh, submit to stronger opinions or people who actually know what they're talking about, so call me out if, uh, if this doesn't make sense what I'm saying. But uh, basically looked into EEG and uh, brain-computer interfaces, what was going on there, and uh, then into nanotechnology and uh, found uh, some experiments where they created uh, ATP-powered nanotube transistors that could basically just turn on and off and would actually embed themselves into a human cell. And I sort of thought, well, what if uh, you created nanotube uh, electrodes and you could have hundreds of billions of these injected into your brain and attaching to every neuron in your brain, sending a signal every time a neuron fires on or off. And then maybe you have two people with all these nanotube electrodes in their brains and they can send a one-way signal. And uh, whatever neurons are firing in my brain then fire in the brain of the person I'm connected to and hence you start experiencing the same thoughts. Uh, so I thought that sort of made sense for movie logic, but there were a million reasons why it wouldn't actually work in real life. Uh, but about, yeah, a few weeks after we finished production, uh, my brother sends me an article from MIT Technology Review, and scientists had invented exactly these nanotube electrodes. They injected them into the brains of lab rats, and uh, they would have them go through identical mazes with their brains connected, and they would go through faster when their brains were connected and sharing information. Uh, so we kind of joke with our movie, by the time it comes out and it's available for you to all see, it'll be historical fiction, uh, <laughs> not uh, sci-fi thriller. Um, but yeah, I guess from the perspective of a filmmaker, I think it's important to think about that with science fiction, there's sort of like two dynamics going on. One, yeah, it's like the actual technology and telepathy was interesting to me for certain reasons, but also oftentimes sci-fi is attractive because it can serve as a metaphor and a great way to make some sort of social commentary. Um, and for me, yeah, telepathy, uh, why telepathy was interesting to me, I guess it's uh, relevant in terms of a discussion on AI, because I sort of from my background, I believe in the power of thought and thought being a stronger reality, possibly, than the world around us. And the film sort of gets into some spiritual aspects of uh, being able to transcend the limitations of the brain through meditation and prayer and things like this. And, uh, and the film also deals with telepathy as a metaphor for social media today. You know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, every day, we're given ways to put our thoughts and feelings out there into the world faster than ever before, but it's not necessarily making us better communicators on a human level. Uh, anyway, so with all these things going on, I guess uh, I might contend that uh, we aren't gods, and uh, we aren't going... The discussion about AI and are we going to create life, and then is it ethical to turn off that life, uh, I think we start getting into different ways of defining what life is. You know, uh, 
Is it the ability to experience a certain emotion, you know, love, hate, pain, suffering, whatever? Is it ability to improve itself, you know, uh, like the singularity we talked about? Uh, and while I might believe that the singularity is possible in terms of creating machines that can improve themselves, I don't necessarily believe, uh, I guess if you take the perspective that a human soul exists, that a rational soul exists, and that, uh, that life is really a reflection of something greater, you know, like if we sort of break down uh, life as maybe a reflection of something greater and think of the rational soul as a mirror, you know, we might have the ability to create a well-polished mirror uh, by creating the ways we think a brain works, but without the reflection of the sunlight in that mirror, we won't have life, uh, so to speak. Um, so I guess that's sort of where I think AI is going. Uh, and I, uh, I'm scared in terms of, you know, AI could be very destructive for the world in terms of these systems that uh, we talked about Avengers Age of Ultron, and you know, I really actually like, if, it, if you guys have seen Age of Ultron, when it, uh, Ultron first becomes conscious and escapes into the internet, and it's sort of like, boom, it's done, he's out there, we don't know, and he could be controlling any systems, that could be weapon systems, whatever, that's a scary thing. Uh, but I'm not as scared of, uh, will we create God or an alien life or something like that, I guess. Anyway, sorry if that's a bit too long. No, that's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, so I, I hope you'll forgive me if I indulge in just a little bit of autobiography, is that all right? Um, so, uh, because science fiction has played a very important role in my, you know, my career and my work in life, really, because uh, when I was a, a boy, I was fascinated by science fiction, and in particular by Asimov's I Robot story. So I really, um, uh, which my father, you know, had read and, and passed on I Robot to me. I read these, uh, these stories, and they, they have you know, a very significant impact on me as a, um, uh, uh, as, a, as a kid. So I really started with science fiction. I really wanted to be Susan and Calvin from the, uh, not necessarily the Susan Calvin from the film, I have to say, but the Susan Calvin from the original um, iRobot uh, uh, I Robot, uh, novels. And of course, it's wonderful, is parenthetically, that Asimov made his engineer here a woman, which is a very good thing. Um, anyway, so she was my sort of fictional hero, and I wanted to kind of grow up in my candlelight Susan Calvin. So, um, and then, then uh, fast forward just a few years, because that would have been in the kind of late 70s, and then in, in the uh, uh, mid, in 1984, William Gibson's Neuromancer came out, and I was very much into my science fiction, uh, and, and, and there was a bit of a buzz about, about this new writer, William Gibson, that a few people had heard of, and he'd written some cool short stories and so on. And so I was very keen to kind of get hold of this, and I got hold of the first edition of the Neuromancer when it came out, and read that. And what we tend to remember these days from, from uh, Neuromancer, it, or, or, or the, the cultural impact of Neuromancer, is really all about um, the way he sort of imagined, well, a couple of amazing things, actually. A, a sort of version of the internet, so the whole, the, 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 as you probably know, the word cyberspace, that originates with William Gibson, and therefore this whole... Uh, you know, having to putting cyber before anything starts really with William Gibson with that, with that novel. And he anticipated a lot about the internet. And one of the things he anticipated uh, you know, um, remarkably, I think, was the democratization of technology. So in, in, uh, in William Gibson, we don't see um, extraordinary technology in the hands of very wealthy people or big corporations or, or governments, but we see it in the hands of just ordinary people on the street. The, the fancy technology is on the street being tinkered with by, you know. And that was a vision that you've never really seen in science fiction very much, or not very much before. And that, I think that's what we tend to remember William Gibson, uh, uh, or, or, because he's still writing now, we, we remember Neuromancer for in particular. But, uh, but also, Neuromancer actually had a remarkably prescient take on artificial intelligence. And, and uh, so looking back on it now, um, but the, the central plot of Neuromancer is really all about AI. And, all, and in Neuromancer, in fact, I think it's the first time that I'm aware of where any uh, writer started using the word AI in, in the following kind of grammar, the AI or an AI. Nobody spoke, as far as I'm aware of, the AI before, before that, that book. I, I, I would ask the, maybe the scholar thinks he knows better than me, but I remember that striking me when I read it. That, that you know, I had nobody talked about the AI, um, 
And it's, so the, the plot is really all about these artificial, these two artificial AIs that want, essentially, that want to kind of get it together. They are Neuromancer and Wintermeet. And the, the, uh, the plot centers around the, the idea that it's, it's, it's illegal, it's prohibited at the time to build an AI that is of human or superhuman level intelligence. And somebody has built these two AIs to try and get around this problem. And if they, essentially, if they get it together, then they will be able to become superhuman level uh, AIs. And that's an, that, now, that looking back on that plot element of Neuromancer from 2015, that's looking you know, just as important, I think, as some of the other uh, aspects of Neuromancer. So then, uh, so then fast forward quite a few years to, to, uh, um, to the, the current uh, time, where, so, so just parenthetically again, I'm, so I'm, I, I, it's made me very uh, happy to be able to then, then contribute back to science fiction through my role in, 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 as an advisor and uh, in, uh, ex machina. So that's been a, been a wonderful thing. And um, uh, now I've got to be, I can't give away plot elements of ex machina, of course, because it would be spoilers. So let's stick with. Um, so, so, so well, sticking we, with. We can check how many people have watched ex machina. Okay. Yeah, how many people who haven't don't want it ruined? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes one, right? So, 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 so we won't spoil it. Only spoil it by ex machina. Um, but, uh, but, but thinking just about that element of William of Neuromancer, so um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, actually, Richard, that one of the things you had in mind you were talking was talking earlier on is, is uh, perhaps uh, Nick Bostrom's work on superintelligence, where they very much emphasise. Um, that you shouldn't anthropomorphize artificial intelligence, and um, and, uh, uh, and the theme of Nick Bostrom's work and, and that of some other people like Eliezer and Yukowski, where they've been, been sort of warning about um, the possibility in the distant future, well, you know, not so distant, by the end of the 21st century, of us building human-level artificial intelligence and then possibly super superhuman. Artificial intelligence, and then they, they say talk about various ways in which that might be might be bad, uh, essentially. Um, and uh, it, it, I think again, it just goes to show how prescient William Gibson was in Europe, in talking about those kinds of scenarios at a time when nobody was. They had the Turing police in the, in the you know, Turing, everybody knows about William about um, uh, Alan Turing now when uh, when. William Gibson wrote that novel. He was a completely obscure character that only geeks and computer scientists like me had heard of, or, or if you were in the game community, you might have heard of him, or you might know about him because of his role in the war, of course. But it was very, he was very much a niche character. Whereas now there are major popular films about Alan Turing, but, but it was the Turing police who uh, were responsible for policing this whole business of not allowing superhuman level AI to, to come about. Okay, so so uh, so one so oh, I got one oh, I got so uh, so so then just getting back to reality now. So now so so now I've had a, a, a very interesting experience in the last year or so interacting with the media on these kinds of issues because it's a very live cultural issue. This uh, this issue of AI and we have those pronouncements by Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. Um, you know, celebrity voices who issue a little sound bite like that. Now they've been reading all of the arguments of people like Nick Bostrom, but none of the nuances of those arguments appear in their little sound bites. And then the media pick up on these sound bites and then reissue the sound bites with a picture of Terminator and some text about how you know, uh, 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 you know that robots are going to take over, rise of the robots, and then inevitably in the blog, uh, in the comments afterwards, somebody uh, comes out with. I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords, uh, <laughs> over, overlords. Um, and uh, so you know, and the, and the cliches kind of multiply and multiply. Now, so 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 there needs to be a little bit of a reality check there because um, it's very very important to distinguish, as as uh, uh, Richard did earlier on, between AI technology, specialist AI technology that is that is oh, as as um, Sarah did in, fact, in her introduction. Um, that is coming online in the, in the relatively short term, so things like self-driving cars and so on, and the way, we, the way corporations process big data, there's lots of AI technology that's going to have quite a significant impact on society and on the economy over the short term. But that is not the kind of thing 
that Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk and Nick Bostrom are talking about, or that we typically see in science fiction films. That kind of thing, human-level AI, we just don't know how to produce that. It's decades away, almost certainly. Um, maybe by, well, I think it's likely that we'll produce it by the end of this century, but, that's, but it's many decades away. So there really is no need to panic right now. On the other hand, on the, on the other hand, <laughs> there is a good motivation, I think, for people working in the field to think very seriously about those issues, because the end of the century will come about. Some, you know, plenty of people alive today will see those times. So I think they, those issues deserve to be taken seriously. But we have to very clearly distinguish between short term, long term. Um, you know, definitely going to happen. Lots of uncertainty. Good. I think um, neuromancer is a good place to start, actually, given the festival that we're at as well, because it's a it's a novel that locates the internet and AI together. And, and obviously, one of the things we want to think about today is the relationship between AI and, and the World Wide Web. Um, I was uh, reading some of um, Murray's material in preparation for um, today, and it, I thought it was very interesting that you were talking about consciousness is created by sort of basic web-like activity. Now, I think you were talking about in the brain, but in Murray's film, when, when you get to see it, there's also lots of images of webs. Not my there's, um, <laughs> oh, not Murray's film, sorry, Carol's film. Um, these are the amazing filming in Cambodia um, on lots of vines intertwined as well. So I'm, I'm curious about, and then we've talked about um, Age of Ultra and disappearing into the internet, and I'm, I'm curious about what role you think the web is going to play in the future of AI, or what role the AI might play in the future of the web. Do you, do you want to start, Ray? I mean, interrupt sure, yeah. each other. I mean, I mean, I'll, I mean well, you know, my background, the last few years I've been working in architecting um, quite a few big data systems in large corporations, and, and sort of on the, you know, sort of immersed in all that, and there are clear things out there that I obviously have to talk about stuff I did because it's commercial and confidential, but there's stuff out there that will be smart and that can help you make decisions and things like that, there are tools. The cars is a good example, when you think about a car, it's probably the biggest killing machine you've ever invented. Um, the number of people who die as a result of the car is enormous, and yet we're handing it over to robots in a, in a, in a couple of years. Um, but it should be a lot safer. Well, that's the argument, that's isn't the it? That, that, that they'll be safer. This, and and yeah. you, see, you see that in the iRobot story yeah, towards absolutely. the end, where the, the, the AI systems are governing the, the balance of the economy in the world system, and there's errors, and the human beings don't understand that the errors are intentional in order to. The word governing, the balance. governing is an interesting one, because that, that's where it is. It's a governor yeah. in an engineering sense. And uh, the, the Entanglement book I've written on, on is, you know, has. Is a society a hundred years from now with all this in place, roboticized economy, everything, and they're giving people for job, jobs to do which are, you know, I've called flow adjusters. They're just getting people to sort of have a look and see if they feel something's happening that's bad, and that's their job. And actually, it's an irrelevant job, but it is a way of keeping people socially useful. And I think there's something of that coming down the line in the online space, where a lot of previous functions we have directly interacted with and taken care of. Right. Um, so, so getting back to, 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 to X Machina again, so this isn't a spoiler, but there's a, in fact, it, it may even be one of the trailers, but there's a moment in the film where uh, Nathan, who's created this humanoid robot, Ava, is talking to Caleb about, um, uh, about how she's been designed and, and built. And, um, uh, and he's holding this sort of blue gel glow, which is her, her brain. And, uh, and he says, that, well, you know, this is the, uh, uh, is the hardware. And then um, Caleb says, well, what's the, the software? And, and, and Nathan says, well, you guessed it, it's Blue Book. Now, in the film, Blue Book is the uh, sort of equivalent of Google, if you like. Google is, Blue Book is the huge corporation that, that Nathan, you know, he's the billionaire CEO of this enormous uh, corporation. And, um, uh, and that's a very, very uh, a perceptive um, point there, because uh, I think it's very likely that, that the way we are going to achieve increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence is um, not necessarily just through embodied interaction with the world, but 
through using the enormous resources of data that are out there on the, on the World Wide Web. So th there, there are a truly staggering amount, a number of sort of texts and images and videos, and they're growing at a very, very rapid rate. And if you have very sophisticated machine learning algorithms that can basically trawl all that data and find patterns in all of that data, then that's, that is uh, one way you can imagine achieving very sophisticated uh, AI. So uh, I think that's, that's a possible you know, role for the web in, uh, in AI for the future. And I think our realities on a personal level are very much formed by the internet. and. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw, like, there was that uh, study Facebook, sort of, or experiment Facebook performed on its own users. Highly unethical. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Facebook performed, um, yes. Yeah, and on personal, you know, how much of us, like, our emotions throughout the day are formed, you know, by what we see on our phones and, you know, our Twitter feeds and what our friends are doing on Facebook. And there's an enormous amount of control we're sort of uh, giving away in that, you know, that this giant corporation can sort of affect our realities in this way. And then, yeah, maybe performing this, basically what they did, they took down a few hundred thousand users and some of them they put only positive messages in their Facebook feed and others they put only negative posts in their Facebook feed to sort of see what would happen to see if it would increase uh, interaction, you know, because they're trying to get you to interact with their software as much as they can. Uh, anyways, the, the amount of data that these corporations are collecting it's got to be staggering, and what you can do with it, I mean, is is scary in a sense. And I guess it, it's it's comforting that panels like this are even happening, you know, because I think uh, it's the public needs to be aware. And uh, you know, as far as we're talking about the internet and AI in the distant future, you know, it's uh, I feel better that you know we're talking about these things now or something. You know, it'd be one thing to be talking about the dangers or ethics or whatever at the end of the century. Yeah. From a dramatic point of view, one, the thing I'm working on at the moment, we're trying to write, struggling with, it also has the notion of data zombies. How many dead versions of me are, are out there <laughs> in data, and how ugly must I look in, in those versions compared to how I look here, obviously. Um, but there are dark and twisted, drunken versions of me out there on networks. Once you get some kind of emergence and the ability to filter and process that stuff, will they come back to haunt me? And this, this notion of data zombies, I just, I'm not tossing that around because I just like the idea, but, mm -hmm. um, but you know, there is a very real sense, and the stuff I was doing, you know, in health insurance was about understanding, creating a version of a person, you know, so we could understand them. And now how far does that go? You know, <laughs> there's a whole, we keep trying to get rid of the Terminator, but we keep saying it'll be back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's my best guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's AI kind of and its relationship with the web, and there's AI that's disembodied. Um, but the other thing is, uh, you know, Age of Ultron, he doesn't go straight into the internet. There's that almost comedic sequence where he's trying to find a body, mm -hmm. and then he keeps finding kind of broken bodies, and he's all a bit kind of drunk and staggery, and then he finds another body. So he tr the AI, as imagined in that film, tries to embody himself. Mm -hmm. He then only goes into the um, internet as his form of escape because he can't be find, found there. And also, in Neuromancer, the novel also about the flesh. It's about um, plugging in uh, to what we now think of as the internet and, and leaving the, the, the flesh, the meat, I think mm. it's called Neuromancer, um, behind. Um, but so many fictional imaginings of AI are much more interested in the embodied type. Um, and, and I'm curious if in that sense, I think the analogy I've come up with is, um, I've done a lot of work on clones as well, so if you think about all the clones films, the island or um, Ishi Goes Never Let Me Go, always imagine the whole clone. The, the, the whole Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, whole, the whole human yeah. being is cloned, and, and that's then what, where the plot, the drama, the interest, the excitement comes from, and the tension. But actually, the real, the, the real thing is that stem cells are just new modern clone individual organs, and that would be much more simple. And we're, we're never going to need to clone entire human beings. So there's this kind of disjunction between the imagining that creates good literature, film, or drama, and what 
actually is probably going to happen but that's in, the dramatic in science. Art. But is in that sense then the question is, is in that sense the literature, the film, the fiction complicit in, in the kind of the mistaken debates that are going on about this? And well, is there a way in which science fiction, or can you think of some science fiction which isn't doing that, which is actually engaging with the, the real things? Yeah, person of interest would be one, any, any others? I mean, the motivation sometimes in creating science fiction isn't necessarily, you know, lots of AIs we see in science fiction, it's not that the authors or creators are really trying to make a statement about AI. Yeah. You know, like Blade Runner is a great yeah. film, uh, and the replicants in that film, I think, you know, it's not necessarily that we're trying to make some statement with AI in that, but when you have this replicant who just wants to meet his maker and he wants more life, you know, like that's something that humans can identify with. You know, it's a way for us to tell a human story and we're doing it through robots and somehow science fiction makes it easier to uh, express some complex ideas, I guess, through metaphor. Uh, and yeah, I guess ones where it's actually about AI for itself, yeah, those are much more rare. You know, uh, it's more fun to tell stories about C3PO and R2D2, you know? Isn't there a way, isn't there a way in, the, in terms of literature, a line right back to fairy tales? In this, in the fairy tales are embodiments of natural intelligence and gods, and, you know, the fairies and things. And is that all we're doing at the moment with a lot of these anthropomorphic robots style mm -hmm. intelligence? Mm -hmm. I mean, are they fairy tales? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I, I think there's, a, there's another sense in which we tend to uh, uh, we tend to see the anthropomorphized uh, uh, AI, which is all to do with this uh, central topic of consciousness. Um, is, is it seems to be taken for granted that uh, uh, an AI or a robot that, is, that has human level intelligence is going to be conscious and capable of feeling and experiencing the world. And I think this is actually a really complex and difficult question. Um, uh, you know, is it the case that, uh, that, that human level intelligence necessarily entails con consciousness? Um, uh, and I think it's actually a very complex question where, where well, I think the way to, to treat it is actually to, to break down consciousness in, 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 into various sort of component parts to dissect it into different psychological attributes that we just expect them all to go together in humans, but which might not, might not arise together um, in, in an AI. So, for example, I think we can speak of, you know, we speak of being conscious of something, being aware of something. And so our awareness of the world, if we do have an embodied AI and it behaves in an intelligent way, then it might be very difficult to, to deny that it has awareness of the world. So you might you know, say, well, it has a sort of consciousness, but at the same time, you might not want to grant it the capacity for suffering, depending upon how it's built and how it behaves. So you can could, you could imagine uh, robots and, and AIs that are very smart, that interact with the world in very sophisticated ways, that you want to grant awareness of the world, and yet that don't have the capacity for suffering, where it doesn't matter if you turn them off. And then, uh, and then you know, the whole really fascinating question is how do you tell the difference? And that is really, that's essentially the question that Ex Machina is dealing with, and many other science fiction films deal, deal with, is how can you tell the difference between something that is genuinely conscious, uh, and capable of suffering, and therefore has rights, and something that is only faking it. Um, and while uh, while there may be lots of incentives to build AI that is manifestly not conscious and isn't pretending to be, um, you can imagine scenarios where where the AI, in order to fulfil maybe goals that we've given it and get to fulfil in ways that we don't expect. Uh, you know, pretends to be very human-like, I and mean, it's going to be very difficult to tell uh, whether it's genuinely conscious or not. And again, that's a theme that I think, sorry for keep talking about ex machina, but uh, that's a theme that's very much explored in, in ex machina, and I, I, I think that it, it's de deliberately never really resolved in ex, in ex machina. And that's what makes it. Star Trek tackle that in the measure of a man. There's not the episodes, so, um, yeah, where data so. has to be proven that he was a sentient being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what's a fundamental yeah. philosophical question. It is. Sure. And, and it, it is a philosophical question, and it's unlikely we'll ever have a, like, have a robot like data, but you know, no, nothing like that will happen. But then is it alive? And this is what I'm struggling with with the writing. Mm -hmm. you know, what version of me that's online is, is actually me? What, 
what machines are actually alive, can we switch them on and off if they're alive, even if they're not conscious. And, and then, just to, to, to dissociate, dissociate further consciousness and intelligence, we, we certainly grant consciousness and the capacity for suffering to non-human animals, and, um, and you know, I, I really don't want my cat to experience hunger or pain, and yet it's nowhere near as smart as a, as a human being. Well, my cat is infinitely more wise than most human beings, but, <laughs> but it's not as intelligent and can't solve the problems like humans mm -hmm. can. And um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a dissociation there as well. Mm -hmm. Clearly quite dissociated concepts, intelligence and consciousness, I think. And yet they tend to be bound together in the science fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question about one of the films on the list? As we, Sarah said there's a list of things we could possibly talk about. One of them was her. Yes. And we haven't mentioned it yet, and it's interesting because that was a very narrow version of AI, but it seems to have disappeared completely, and not really caught on as a, what, as the a film. Or the yeah, well, the, as a cultural thing, I don't think the film, I think the film was very good, but I don't think it's had anything like the impact of some of the other films we've talked yeah. about. And I just wondered why perhaps that wasn't. You know, well, why? actually that links to what I think will be my last question to the panel, and hopefully be something that opens out to the audience, which is I'm very conscious that I'm the only woman sitting up in the stage, and um, one of the, the big issues with it, embodied AI imagining is that it's so often female. And this goes right back to um, Maria in Metropolis, um, comes through the sex plots in, in uh, Blade Runner, through to um, Ex Magna, and it's, and it's there in her, and my answer would be that her hasn't had the impact because she's not embodied. So there isn't, there's not the kind of fascination with the, the female robot because she's only a voice. Yeah, it's not there's like no the body. Yeah, yeah, so I, I think that would be a, a kind of very uh, crude <laughs> response to that. But, but I, am, I think it's a really important point that uh, this is something, it, it's not science fiction, but Game of Thrones, we must have some Game of Thrones fans in here. Maybe we don't, maybe uh, uh, they, they've not come to a science fiction talk because it's fantasy, I don't know. But um, one of the things that really annoyed me about Game of Thrones is you go, that, you go to such extents to imagine a different world. And the one thing you don't reimagine is patriarchy and gender relationships. And that's, for me, that's so unimaginative. It's like you can change everything, but women still behave in a feminine way, and men, men are all still sex-driven, and, and, and that's kind of not even challenged. And, I, and this is what I'm kind of curious about in Ex Machina, but also that I do think that... If any, has anyone read M. John Harrison? Yes, right, fantastic um, author, uh, his Kefuchi track tr trilogy. If you want a writer that is imagining truly alien intelligence, read the Kefuchi track um, novels, because I, I think you'd love them, and he's doing what you imagine. But also what happens in his novel is that gender just breaks down in, in any kind of way, because he's moved beyond the human. And, and it seems like if we anthropomorphize it, we cannot help but gender it as well because gendering is something so integral to being human. So I think there's, there's potential for much more science fiction that is more imaginative both about the alienness mm -hmm. of artificial intelligence and as a result the, the, the non-genderedness. But I guess, you know, as I men, that, I'm curious about... All the screen is not gender about well, that. Not at yeah. all, exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. Although it is a bit... Obelisky, obelisky, <laughs> possibly, yeah. possibly. I've never seen anything yeah. shaped. It would like be that. a bit more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a bit more curvy, it could be vagina shaped. <laughs> um, but yes, a question about any thoughts on gender before we then open out to the uh, audience. I think we need more women filmmakers and storytellers. You know, yes. that's sort of the short answer. You know, as long as most people who are creating content are male, you're going to see more of the same uh, gender roles and. Uh, Yes, men need be men are able and should be telling stories about women too. But we also need more female filmmakers, and there's just such a lack of them right now. And hopefully, we do as much to change that. So, yeah. There is a lovely moment in which I won't give too much detail about because it will be a spoiler for your film. But where I was, I was very lucky to have um, some secret advanced access to Kyle's film. Um, and at first, I was like, "Oh, here we go again, the sexy longer." And then there's a twist, and you realise that that's not exactly what's happening. So it was lovely to see that you playing with those stereotypes and then moving beyond them, which is good. Yeah. Um, we have uh, about ten minutes or so for questions from the audience. Yeah, my first eye came there. Please go ahead. Yes, there, um, there is a, um, a machine called the drone. There are lots of different I'm not kinds sure of drones. Right, actually, on the um, Could uh, drones um, 
which are used um, in their cap capability is a very destructive capability and they exist in many different forms. Can drones. you repeat the very beginning what you're talking about? Uh, drones. drones. Drones, okay, sorry. Drones. 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 Yeah. A type of machine, but it can't exist on its own. It has to be directed and um, its lethal uh, charge has to be discharged by somebody who sits uh, maybe in a, a container in the Nevada desert. He's a member of the American military. And he has to do it in a very uh, uh, intelligent way, but um, in a very non, without any empathy to what the result of his actions are. So you have a machine coupled with uh, an intelligent but non, non feeling human being um, uh, who in, is himself instructed by, um, let's say, Barack Obama you know, the President of the United States, who every, once a week decides on who should be killed, where the drones should be sent. So you have a sort of coupling with, uh, of um, <laughs> a top man, and he, and he represents the needs of a, a superpower, and what that superpower has to achieve in the world, with uh, somebody who could be called um, a robot, uh, a military man uh, who just directs um, then the kind of uh, machinery which the drones are to kill. So you have a, not just one robot in which all these things are combined, but you have a robot which is directed, executed, and then discharged. Uh, so you, you know this is this is all actually happening. We're talking about a lot of filming things, but what is actually happening is something quite robotic and quite dangerous. So and the concern is the, the what are the dangers? Is, you know, could yes. that be? Uh, you know, could we have a, a discussion about what's real, what's actually out there, uh, rather than what is you know somewhere in the future? I think I think that taps into a broader question about. Um, Will, will humans in some way be dehumanized by their interaction with the robotic or the machine? That might be. Well, and also, present day right now, we could put an AI into a drone. You know, that's not like some crazy hypothetical for the future. We could set some parameters in software, in drones, and they could be making decisions over human life. And it'd be so easy for that. You know, it's a fantastic idea. I mean, that's the plot of Captain America, or the last Captain America film, and it seems fantastic. But that's something we could do today, right now, really. Uh, yeah, that's a terrifying thought, I think. Uh, well, that way you can split the, um, you just take away the, the middleman, the person who controls the leaders and stuff. The robotic cars exist. I mean, you know, they make decisions every second of their journey. You know, they make decisions to stop before they hit people, except they're wanting the news this week. Um, you know, uh, yeah, no, it rolled. Did a car hit someone this week? Rolled forwards at a display and hit somebody, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, it's about the only accident we've had with them, mm -hmm. telling them. But this has been there at the heart. I mean, oddly, it does come back to fiction because you know, Asimov. The, all of Asimov's stories are developed because of these rules for robots, which was yeah. an attempt to build into their programming um, ethics. Um, and it's there in Asimov, and it's there in um, David Mitchell's Ghost Written. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. It has an AI in it, and and he it it is programmed um, with the equivalent of these rules for robotics, okay. and then has a similar moral. Well, if you go back to Asimov, you mentioned I robot, of course, Calvin was a psychologist, wasn't she? Yeah. yeah. Rather yeah. than an actual robot, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We have a, 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 a gentleman <laughs> waiting down here. Go ahead, please. I've got a film premiering. Oh, premiering at the Sheffield Documentary Festival next week. Now, I want to make a feature film about mass psychosis. You've got a, a film out, The Falling, that's just come out recently, and your film about telepathy, uh, what you say about it. Do you agree the area of consciousness are working to prevent the corruption of consciousness as something that's very much in the air right now? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, um, I mean, the ideas of consciousness, and you've talked about it some, um, I think we talk about the brain and we describe it as a computer oftentimes, and, you know, think of, like, memory and data and whatnot, and we describe the brain as a computer all the time, but that's a, that's a metaphor, and sometimes we forget that's a metaphor. 
and the way the brain works and con the way consciousness and life and thought and all this stuff works is not like a computer at all. And I don't think we're anywhere near actually understanding uh, maybe the difference between uh, physical powers and intellectual powers. You know, you'd say we have physical senses of uh, touch, taste, sight, uh, smell, and feeling. Uh, and these are things we can maybe more easily uh, program and create robots or whatever it is, you know, AI to have these physical powers. But intellectual powers like imagination, uh, thought, memory, comprehension, and maybe some sort of common faculty that uh, communicates between the physical powers and intellectual powers. Um, these are things I think we don't really understand how they work. And those, those intellectual powers are part of what I would like term as life, I guess, you know, what we call the human spirit or the rational soul. And, uh, and yeah, the corruption of those and control of those is uh, something we need to be aware of, I guess. But, uh, but I, don't, I don't think that's going to happen overnight that we're going to create AI that's going to replicate these things because I think we're so far from even understanding how they work. Uh, in the human body, uh, or the human being, or spirit, whatever you want to say. So, um, uh, slightly, slightly off uh, uh, thought, but one thing that I think that has come up in a, in a couple of the recent science fiction films is this idea of uploading consciousness. And so, uh, well, in, transcendence. We, we see that in Transcenders yes. and yes. in Chappie. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it's just, uh, well, it, conceptually, it's not. Uh, completely uh, silly by any means, but the way we see it done in these films is just so, you just cringe with embarrassment <laughs> where these guys, like sitting, I mean, you know, Johnny Depp is sitting there with this, like, bog standard EEG thing on his head, and, and a rack of computers that might be in my lab are sitting behind him, and somehow it does this thing which we, which is completely science fiction fantasy many, many, many decades away, and his, his consciousness is miraculously uploaded down these wires into the movie. Now, there are, the, 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 you can certainly discuss the, uh, the, the, how that would be done for real, and that's a very interesting uh, uh, topic of discussion, the, the science that you would require to to scan the brain in sufficient detail and produce a whole brain emulation, but it's not going to work with the electrodes and a, and a rack of disk drives behind them, that's for sure. And you see that in both in, Cha in Chappie. In Chappie, amazingly, the same kit works with a human and with a robot. I mean, you know, and in Chappie, they did it with PS4s, I think, right? <laughs> um, we've probably got time for one more question. This gentleman got his hand up first. I'm sorry, you can talk to us afterwards if you Um at the beginning, it's really about person of interest, and in person of interest, you have two AIs. And the character group refers to one of them as God or She. It's always She and it's God. And the second Samaritan is actually acting as a judge of human race. How does the panel think that any real artificial consciousness, not intelligence, might have that kind of um, dynamic, that potential? Because it could experience reality at a quantum level, potentially, rather than just on a coarse level. There's only old saying that modern technology is indistinguishable from magic for people 2,000 years ago. Would consciousness, a artificial consciousness, be just like God to us? And the final thing, question you can answer, even question, have you read um, Roderick by John Sladek? And if not, why not? Okay, uh, very quickly, panel, please, if you could have a response to that. Well, I mean, there's your totally alien, you know, take on it. And I think person of interest is interesting, particularly in seasons three and four, as they're now transpiring, because they've really got the roots of the AI stories. And that notion of the, the thing that she thinks is God, it's made very clear she's a psychopath. So she, it is, and it's made she's early on better. in season two. I think we're well, starting to geek out on person of interest. No, yeah. but the point is she's psychopathic, so she's, in a way, for me, dramatically, the reflection of what might happen if you have this state of mind and you have this kind of knowledge. Because all that machine is doing is the same thing as the other machine is doing. It's she's interpreting it differently to those. I think, I think this panel is a, a bit like um, Sorry. Uh, the, the <laughs> AI. About this after, but, yeah. Do you remember the, the computer in Superman 3 that they, they have to try and turn off and then it just sources all its power? I think I'm feeling that this panel is 
um, going to be quite difficult to turn off, but unfortunately uh, we're going to have to. Thank you very much everybody for coming. It's been a pleasure and thank you to our panellists. Uh, oh, I've suddenly got very loud. Hang around if you wish for um, Toronto based famous new media artist Jeremy Bailey on stage next. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for stopping to say with David and My name is James Cadre. It's my pleasure to introduce the next session. And today, the majority of patents are granted for software, often for absurdly abstract concepts. Our mobile-centric post-PC era will soon give way to a world of augmented technology and the Internet of Things. The world's largest tech companies are now in a race to patent the world at large as software. In this world, our bodies are the interface and potentially patent infringing. Hope is not lost, though. Someone has the answers you need to cross part of this new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, famous new media artist, Jeremy Bain. Thank you. Hi guys, just a second here, just setting up. I'm almost set. Okay. Right, there we go, my eyes on. There I am. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be here um, at South Bank Center. 